and the ultimate result was the elimination of the slaves from, slaves from their mother's cultures, uh, which basically relied on communal uh, consciousness. Uh, this was carried uh, out by means of enforcing monotheistic Christianity, which was uh, alien to uh, the slaves, and European languages, of course. Yet, despite these colonial uh, agendas, uh, the survival of African cultures uh, was possible through uh, orality. And it is in this context that Raboto uh, says that at least in some areas of the Americas, the gods of Africa continue to live in exile. Uh, in the uh, second part of my uh, presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, the dichotomous relationship between African communotheism and Christian monotheism. So, uh, Africa and Europe entertain divergent worldviews, and so this is evidenced in their religious imagining, basically. Uh, because Christianity is considered to be a metacosmic religion, which is different from uh, communotheistic uh, religions in Africa, which are basically considered to be cosmic uh, religions. Uh, when it comes to African communotheism, which is uh, the locus of my uh, paper, uh, it asserts that the divine, quote, is a community of interdependent, er, interrelated gods who are united by a common ontological source. And so, in African co cosmology, there is no hierarchy. Everyone, all of the gods are equal, and they have this relationship of interdependence. So, accordingly, the plethora of gods are principally represented as aggregates of family, uh, organically linked by their essential nature. Uh, this defines the absence of hierarchies as a pivotal characteristic of African communism. And of course, it is this very characteristic that is absent in Christian monotheism. Because Christian monotheism advocates the belief in one God, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one Catholic Church, and this is how one would express the hierarchical series on which the Catholic Unitarian ideology is based. And of course, this hierarchy uh, contributed to the feelings of superiority and uh, the uh, exclusivist, exclusivist sorry, approach that the colonials adopted in their, uh, let's say, encounters with the other. And so they excluded the other's uh, religious beliefs and their uh, divinity. Also, there was a common identification of African gods as demons or devils. And so Africans in general were uh, accused of devil worship by colonial uh, forces. So conversely, Central African and West African diasporic religions, and here I'm borrowing the concept uh, devised by Joseph Murphy, owe their survival to their dynamism, vitality, heterogeneity, adaptability and openness to, quote, syncretism with other religi re religious story traditions and for the continuity of a distinctively African religious consciousness. <coughs> and this, of course, leads me to talk about West Indian religious syncretism, uh, which is the main point in my presentation. So, the hybridization of Obia with Amerindian or Christian beliefs is basically what is uh, meant by a religious syncretism. Now, Obia is a new concept here. I did not talk about it before due to uh, the uh, question of log logical transition. So, Obia is basically a communotheistic spiritual practice that applies to, quote, a wide variety and range of beliefs and practices related to the control and channeling of supernatural spiritual forces. And so it is identified by the colonizer as an indicator of, quote, African savagery and a form of, quote, Negro atheism. And so, Obia was basically demonized by uh, the colonial forces and it was uh, considered as a form of superstition, uh, which led to their imposition of slave laws that forbade basically the uh, practice of Obia. And of course, their respective divergence 
from that of the slaves, because the slaves held a different worldview, and for them, Obia was far from being a, a, worship, a devil worship or a veneration of demons. So, the colonialization of African based religions is a characteristic of the Caribbean, through, uh, which was made possible through processes of coercion and resistance. Acculturation and appropri uh, appropriation, sorry. In this uh, context, Roger Bastide, in his 1971 book, uh, distinguishes among three types of religious syncretism. So the first type for him was institutional syncretism, the second one being syncretism by correspondence, and finally, morphological or mosaic syncretism. And uh, due to, time, uh, to the time uh, limitation, I'm going to only define mor morphological syncretism because uh, it is the concept I'm going to adopt in my uh, analysis. So, morphological or mosaic syncretism is basically the juxtaposition of African derived elements and Catholic symbols. So, when it comes to uh, the text I'm going to uh, focus on, uh, they are uh, the works of the Caribbean author uh, Jamaica Kincaid. Uh, the titles are Annie John and uh, the autobiography of my mother. So, for Kincaid, syncretism is highly problematical because it cannot uh, can, uh, be considered as purely positive because it can be equally uh, perceived as something uh, negative uh, if we are going to see it from a religious perspective. So, the works of Kincaid are basically contaminated by references to uh, monotheistic Christianity, Odia, and West Indian religious syncretism as uh, cultural characteristics of the West Indies in general. And so in this, uh, in this way, her texts can be considered syncretic themselves. So, as systems of beliefs, however, they do not have the same level of importance when it comes to the writer, because for her, Christianity uh, remains uh, the, um, let's say, the system of belief of the colonizer. And so it cannot have the same uh, level of importance as the uh, matrilineal uh, systems of uh, beliefs. Especially that if we consider the question of uh, religion in the West Indies, it goes hand in hand with the question of race. And since we have race hierarchies, we talk also about religious hierarchies as well. So, institutional Christianity, in the autobiography of my mother specifically, figures as a sign of hegemony because uh, the novel talks about how the Church of England used slaves to build it with their own uh, sweat and blood, and yet uh, uh, when uh, they died, they were buried with their faces uh, turned towards the West. So that, so that they do not go to heaven uh, in the afterlife. And this approach, when it comes to the Church of England, was basically discriminatory and even inhumane when it comes to those uh, slaves. For this reason, it is considered to have a jeopardizing impact on the uh, West Indian subjectivity because it functions uh, to dehumanize it, according to King Cain's again. And so, Kincaid problematizes sorry, religious syncretism in as much as it includes Christianity, because for her, West Indian syncretism is also inclusive of Amerindian, uh, a reference to the natives of uh, American Red Indians, uh, Amerindian cultures, and so uh, she, she finds it to be problematical only in as much as it includes the colonial uh, religion. So, uh, when it comes to Annie John, uh, there are uh, references to morphological syncretism because the protagonist of the novel, who is also the narrator, Annie John, was subject uh, to uh, some mysterious illness uh, during her uh, childhood. And so her family took her to uh, the, uh, initially to an English doctor, but the uh, modern medicine uh, failed to uh, actually heal the young girl. And so they resorted to Obia. But Obia was presented in two figures who are Majuli and Maches. Majuli relied on morphological syncretism because uh, during the rituals, she, she used both uh, fetishes and herbs uh, that belong to the Obia practice. And also she used the cross, which is uh, you know, a, a Christian religion.
religious symbol. And uh, strategically, her healing failed. So the young girl did not heal. And this is, of course, because of the, uh, let's say, um, infertility of Odia because of the intrusion of uh, Christianity uh, in uh, the practice. The ultimate healing of uh, young Annie was thanks to her own grandmother, Matches, who was a pure Odia practitioner. So she was not into Christianity at all. And through this uh, strategic uh, choice of Matches to be the perfect healer, uh, is actually symbolic of P.K. the writer's own um, veneration of Odia as the mode through which healing is possible. And so, uh, I hereby uh, reach the findings of uh, my uh, paper, if I may. So, uh, to a certain extent, Kincaid celebrates cultural hybridity as characteristic of the West Indies. Uh, Everyone did quote Pan Caribbean cultural synthesis that stresses unity while ma maintaining diversity. Uh, her books, uh, Annie John and the Autobiography of My Mother, uh, are basically syncretic texts celebrating the Caribbean hybrid identity. Yet, Kincaid renounces religious syncretism that implies race power hierarchies that is, that includes uh, colonial or monotheistic uh, Christianity. And so, she rejects a religious syncretism that, between quotation marks, cancerizes spirituality through organized religion. And uh, ultimately, she opts for a Bida, uh, which allows direct connections with the pre-colonial cultures, as a site of resistance and the power of healing. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm sorry if some things do not <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for this super interesting paper. And also for taking the time. It's really perfect. Perfect timing. Um, I, uh, I actually, sorry, I had to skip some parts so that, that I keep sure. in the time. Yes, so, yeah. yes, yes. And uh, we move to Salah uh, right? Uh, and then, uh, so you teach uh, Jesus? I think. Yes, Jesus. And you teach? Sorry? Yes. Uh, at the Faculty of Arts, Jesus. So, yeah. oh, okay, right. Uh, Salah uh, writes his paper, it's titled And Development Hybridity in Adrian Kennedy's Funny House of the Negro and the Owl Answers. The Equality Horse. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I'm going you know, to present my paper, as you mentioned earlier, about Adrian Kennedy's uh, ambivalent hybridity in her two uh, plays, very famous plays, uh, written in the uh, 60s. But before that, I'm going you know, to, um, to say a few words about this uh, playwright, Adrian Kennedy. Uh, so Adrian Kennedy can be depicted as one of the leading writers of the African uh, American world and one of the uh, of its intellectuals. She has been a leading voice in black literature and culture for more than six decades and is regarded as the most influential postmodern African American woman to write in the field of theater. Very much in the vanguard of what has been called the revolutionary theater. Adrian Kennedy has since been focusing on the African-American issues uh, and dramatic writing. Her widely lyrical language on phantasmagoric stage has implicitly bestowed on her uh, theater a sense of peculiarity since the appearance of her first plays, Sanios of Negro, in 1964, and The Young Lancers in 1965. In her plays, she presents the tragic experience of black people and the plight they met, and the, uh, you know, the plight they go through when they come into contact with themselves and the world around them. Now, reading Adrian Kennedy's place, one would inevitably recognize her ambivalent feature in dealing with different issues as a black identity 
a mimicry and hybrid, which revealed the power of relationship between blacks and whites. A hybrid relationship that hides the imbalance, the uh, imbalance of power between the colonizer and the colonizer. In other words, hybridity conceals behind it a sense of negating and neglecting those who endeavor to pass for uh, uh, white uh, color or to pass for white identity. From such an encounter between the colonizers of Germany and the colonizers of Saint-Blanc, their emergence, the concept of hybridity, that's to say, hybridity is ambivalent in Adrian Kennedy's plays that I mentioned earlier, uh, because it divulges the black psychological bewilderment and trauma when they long to have a white identity. Adrian Kennedy's people come to prove their ambivalent hybridity through mimicry. Sarah in Funny House of Negro, the protagonist of this play, and Clara. Uh, in uh, the Our Answers are good examples of the ambivalent hybrid people who reluctantly adopt to the white's behavior. Their real name to belong to the white community places them in position they were where they betray their blackness. Their effort to pass through their defect, defect between two inverted commas, because uh, these two protagonists in these plays, they you know, describe themselves as defect. In other words, blackness as a defect, as a blemish, become ridiculous as it is an impossible mission that ends up with a complete failure. Perhaps the end of both protagonists and both uh, plays sums up their inevitable ambivalence towards embracing one clear and unified identity, a biological black identity or a miraculous and attainable, uh, and attainable uh, identity. So approaching the issue of hybridity in uh, Funny House of Negro and the Our Answers aims at dealing with the various relationships with the, which connect the protagonists with the others, as well as the whole world around them. Actually, because they are dramatically and artistically uh, placed in the uh, center, the uh, protagonists are tragically uh, and psychologically relocated in the periphery. This shows profound, the profound psychological uncertainty of their relationship with themselves and the white world, which uh, represents the crux of their identity. And their bewildered journey towards constructing a hybrid identity, Sarah in Funny House of Negro and her soul sister Clara in the Our Dancers are split into different selves. Each one represents a specific ideology. The black star, or as a, uh, in, the, uh, in this place, you know, are named the Negro people or the Negro Sara, seeks refuge in the historical as well as religious uh, people or religious outlets that construct her hybrid character. Uh, you know, she, for example, identifies herself with uh, um, the uh, royal family uh, characters, as for example. Queen Victoria, um, the Duchess of Habsburg, and also the religious character, Jesus, and also, also the black leader of the previous Congo, uh, the previous Zaire, you know, and Congo now, uh, Patriots Lumumba. That would, you know, uh, these opposed, opposed as they are, these people built her, her hybrid identity. That would later anticipate the failure to acquire very clear identity. Likewise, Clara's hybrid identity appears ambiguous and unclear, yet ambiguous. She belongs to an English white uh, father and a black woman. Though this miscegenation, Clara's, uh, Clara is excluded from and rejected by the white world to which she, she may belong to. She may belong to. In front of this denial, Clara tries to show she belongs to significant white figures who stand for English literature, as for example, William Shakespeare, as for example, William Shakespeare, Chaucer Jeffrey, uh, Charles Dickens, 
and uh, you know, uh, political uh, figures like William the Conqueror and Anne Boleyn. Yet though, her excessive triumph to be recognized by these English people, English white figures, Clara was excluded and interdicted, even to enter the chapel where her white father, her white English father, uh, uh, had been buried. I told from these white people that she longs to uh, assimilate. I quote, if you are his ancestor, his, you know, uh, her father's ancestor, why you are a Negro? In this context, you know, I'd like, you know, to mention, and whenever I reach this uh, stage, you know, I always, you know, uh, remember Homi Baba's, you know, uh, words when he said that uh, to be anglicized is emphatically not the English. Hybridity in uh, this Kennedyesque world cannot be, cannot be explained without other concepts such as memory uh, and ambivalence, as they all overlapping, they are overlapping together. In fact, the terms, these terms have become the most recurrent concepts in post-colonial critical approach. For example, the term memory, for example, does not necessarily imply uh, a replica of uh, the other's behavior, manners and morals, that is to say, cultural habits and values. Memory is, as Homi Baba mentions or states, I quote the desire for a reformed recognizable other as a subject of a difference that is almost the same, but not quite. In post-colonial theory, memory is regarded as a crucial term for the it's, uh, for it deals with the ambivalent relationship to the colonizer and colonizer. Thus, in order for memory to be effective, it must be or it must you know continually produce uh, you know uh, its slippage, its excess, and its difference. This implies that the ex-colonizer subjects mimicking the colonizer's culture, language, and values is fraught with the mockery. Uh, and produces nothing but, I call it a blurred copy of the uh, of the person or of the culture that she, Clara or, or, or Sarah, wants to transcend herself to. As for the term ambivalence, it was first it was first developed by psychoanalysis. Uh, it developed in psychoanalysis to describe, I call a continual fluctuation between wanting one thing and its opposite. It also delineates a simultaneous attraction toward and repulsion from an object, a person or action. End of quote. It was then Homi Baba who has first adopted the term ambivalence and hybridity to the colonial critical thought. According to him, ambivalence explains the complicated relationship with the colonizer and the conflicting forces. Because of their ambivalent relationship, some colonizer subjects show their infatuation with and admiration to uh, admiration for the colonizer. Other, however, reveal a strong resistance towards the colonizer. Submission and or resistance since the colonizer never abolished total or complete opposition to the colonizer. From such an encounter between the colonizers in Germany and the colonizer summons, there emerged the concept of ambivalent hybridity. In Adrian Kennedy's Funny House of the Negro and the Album Answers, both protagonists best incarnate the subject of miscegenation par excellence. These two black girls find themselves locked in a very limited space in which they mourn their mixed racial heritage. This tragedy revealed their psychological dividedness and bewilderment and loss. They really live a true crisis of identity, which appears to be the aftermath of their ambivalent hybridity of the white culture by either internalizing its values or declining it and return to embrace their African roots. They are really in a crisis of identity, of identification. Shall I Five minutes? Yes, sir. Okay. Now uh, I will move you know, to uh, something else. From a post colonial 
perspective, these hybrid people represent inappropriate subjects because of their strong desire to be exactly the white world, which produces an identity, all, I call it almost the same, but not white. This means that the hybrid people's inappropriateness disrupts not only their real identity, but rather it disturbs the power of colonial authority. In Kennedy's place, hybridity is ambivalent and cannot take place. Both Sarah and, and, and Clara fail at making ends meet. By the end of both plays, which reverberates Kennedy's own vision, ambivalent vision, Sarah, Sarah's suicide in Finney House of Na Negro and Clara's metamorphosis into an owl and the owl answer divulges that Adrian Kennedy wants that the chest and the rapture of desire to hybridize with the other, that say the white man of culture, more ambivalent. Babas calls this double vision, which is the outcome of the partial representation of the colonial object who in turn produce a partial gaze of the presence of the colonizer where the observer becomes the observant. And partial representation rearticulates the whole notion of identity and alienates it from the sense. It is this justice, generous space ethically via the colonizer subject that produces the ambivalence of hybridity and present it much more in the form of threat and a likeness rather than in the form of similarity and similarities. To end, I'd like you know, to conclude by the following. We could only say that hybridity in Kennedy's two plays, Funny House of Negro and the Our Answers, uh, you know, would never take place due to the ambivalence that traps the relationship up between Sarah and Clara and the white world they you know, both attempt to copy and hybridize with, but to no avail. This produces ambivalent subjects who reveal a continual association between desiring one thing and desiring its opposite. Because their hybrid is ambivalent, this generates the seeds of their destruction. By the end of each play, Sarah commits suicide and uh, Clara metamorphoses into an owl. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I skipped you know, more than three pieces. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> no problem, no problem. But, I mean, uh, you are going to publish, aren't you? Uh, yes, I'm going okay, to publish. Okay, so we are going to read the full paper later on <laughs> when it's published. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, two more uh, presentations, uh, two online uh, presentations. Uh, is uh, Rafiq Kamasodi ready? Rafiq <laughs> Masoudi is ready. Hello. Hello, Rafiq. Thank you. 